I'll say this plainly, I've said it before, taxation is theft. It presumes that the government has a higher claim on our property than we do. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're very happy to be talking with Judge Andrew Napolitano, the host of the great Fox business show Freedom Watch, as well as the author of the new book, It is Dangerous to be Right When Your Government is Wrong. Judge Andrew Napolitano, thanks for talking to us. Pleasure to be here, Nick. It's nice to have the opposite role of what you and I normally have. This time, you're the inquisitor. I am not sure which is more terrifying for me, <laughs> but I can go with it. Here, uh, you know, a short history of some of the books that you've been uh, turning out over the past few years include uh, Constitutional Chaos. Then you have titles like To a Nation of Sheep, or rather, A Nation of Sheep to Dred Scott's Revenge. To your current book, It is Dangerous to be Right When Your Government is Don't Wrong. Don't forget the Constitution in Exile. Oh, no, I know that as well as, as well as Dred Scott's Revenge. But I mean, I sense in the arc of your titles more militancy. Um, do you feel that we're on a downward path uh, irrevocably or irrevocably towards a loss of freedom and liberty? I think we're on a downward path. I don't think it's irrevocable. And I have to give full credit for the title of this book to Voltaire, who actually mm -hmm. suggested it to me one day. Right. Of course, it's 250 years old and a famous phrase from him, it is dangerous to be right, right. when the government is wrong. Look, in one respect, women have uh, full rights and African Americans have full rights. It shouldn't be something we are happy about, but when right. you consider the historic treatment of African Americans and women, it's about time they have those rights. And as much as I love Jefferson, mm -hmm. they didn't have them in that era. In, in that respect, we are a broader, more expansive, uh, freer society. But with respect to the level of regulation by the government, mm -hmm. the areas of human behavior utterly and totally dominated by the federal government, much less a, a, a state government, um, the surveillance state, the welfare state, the warfare state, the regulatory state, the administrative state, we are on a downward spiral and we are losing liberty with every tick of the clock and unless we get a game changer in the White House and the Congress or on the courts, the spiral will continue. One of the, your chapters has to do with the right to own property. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, if we go back to the Kelo decision, which was what, 2005? Right. Uh, you know, that, that was horrible, the Kelo decision, which basically the Supreme Court said, yeah, a state jurisdiction or a, a, you know, a, a state political body can take whatever they want uh, from a private property owner immediately to turn it over to another private property owner as eminent domain abuse you know, defined. But that also sparked a counter uh, force against eminent domain abuse. So are we fighting the good fight or, or, you know, in, in these cases? We are fighting the good fight. In fact, just three days ago, the good people of the state of Mississippi amended the state's constitution to prohibit any state government in Mississippi uh, from doing what the Supreme Court authorized uh, in Kelo. And of course the case, the Kelo case only got to the Supreme Court because the state of Connecticut did not have uh, such a prohibition. Uh, but as much as I love the Fifth Amendment, uh, which requires that if the government wants life, liberty, or property, it has to engage in due process, which prohibits torture and compelled testimony against oneself. It is the linchpin of big government. Here's why. Jefferson argued, and I believe, that the only moral, valid, lawful exchange of property is one that is truly voluntary. Hamilton wanted at the Constitutional Convention the same powers that the king did, which is the power to take any property, and the king would decide whether or not he owed you anything. They compromised with the Fifth Amendment, which is the government can take what it wants, but it's got to pay you a fair value for it, and the government has to use it for a public use. Jefferson warned that the public use would be whatever the government wanted its friends to have, and that's where we are. And it's because Jefferson's warnings were disregarded that the government can now take anything. So I ask in the book, do we really own anything? Can the government take that infamous leather jacket that you're now wearing? Answer, yes, it can. I just if hope it pays that, you the fair market value Yeah, I was going to say it's really not worth very much. So, because um, it's yeah, yours, no. it's worth a fortune. I was going to say it's even more. <laughs> as soon as, it's like a car, Judge. As soon as I walk out of the store with it, 50% is off the bat. <laughs> well, let's, uh, you, you also talk, and I mean, you, you have a long list, basically, of all of the, uh, you know, all of our, our basic rights. Uh, the right to speech, there's no question that with, uh, you know, in any number of ways, the government at all levels is constantly trying to re re uh, restrain and curtail our speech, political expression, things like that. By the same token, 
you know, technologically, it's clear that we're able to express ourselves more freely and more effectively than ever. We saw this with, you know, things like McCain-Feingold, uh, you know, and the, the attempt to uh, use campaign finance uh, laws in order to stop political speech. Forget about what the Supreme Court said in Citizens United. I mean, the fact is, is that people are now able to express themselves more freely. Is the, do, you, do you buy that, and is that enough? No, or, I, I, I don't buy it. Okay. Uh, two FBI agents walk into a library in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and one of them has a self-written search warrant under his arm. I know this sounds like a joke. Two guys walk into right. a bar, one has a duck under his arm, but it's true. And they serve a self-written, a, a search warrant, which under the Patriot Act, they, author, they wrote for themselves and authorized themselves to the head librarian saying, we want to know what book so-and-so is taking out. And by the way, you can't tell anybody that we were here. The librarian is 86 years old. The FBI agents are in their early 30s. She says, who the hell are you? She hands the search warrant to her 75-year-old assistant. Fast forward two years later, they're in court because they talked about it. The latest trend in, in free speech violations is compelled speech. There, there's a sub rosa trend amongst prosecutors now to prosecute people for failing to report crimes that they have witnessed. And I will tell you, under the law, you have no obligation to report anything that you see except treason. There have only been seven treason prosecutions in 230 uh, years. The same First Amendment, which prohibits the Congress from infringing free speech, prohibits it from compelling speech. So prosecuting someone for not speaking and then prosecuting someone for speaking truthfully, I got a search warrant from the FBI, what should I do about it, are egregious violations of the First Amendment. You, uh, you were talking about we need to get people in the courts, in the White House, in Congress. I mean, is this something that is going to be solved, or these infringements and incursions on our rights, uh, is that really going to be solved by politics? Or how do, uh, because isn't politics the problem? Politics is the problem, Nick. It's a good question. When, when George W. Bush was uh, elected in 2000, but put aside the yeah. manner of his election. I wrote about that and I was critical of the court. And the Republicans took over the Congress. Like a lot of libertarians, I rejoiced because I thought after these years of Bill Clinton, we'll finally get small government. Instead, we got a government that was less faithful to the Constitution than any government since Abraham Lincoln's years because there's just a Republican version of big government. So when I say a game changer in the White House or the Congress or the courts, I'm talking about somebody like Ron Paul, someone who is utterly, totally, and, and without exception, faithful to the values of the primacy of the individual. The government must stay within the confines of the Constitution. So for Ron Paul to return us to that government, would require half the Congress agreeing with him and half the Supreme Court agreeing with him. Do I expect that to happen miraculously in the next 13 months? I don't, but it could. And I mean, you must take, uh, I, I think a lot of people who believe in limited government and libertarian ideals, I mean, when you look at the popularity of Ron Paul, who those of us in the movement have been following him for decades, but right. I mean, over the past five years, he's emerged as you know, one of the great national leaders of the debate, uh, you know, in politics. I, and I like to, to think that uh, Ron Paul is Barry Goldwater, mm -hmm. and somewhere out there in the next generation is Ronald Reagan. Yeah. There wasn't a Reagan revolution. Yeah, was it didn't say, happen was, the way we thought it would happen. So you want somebody to come happen. after Ron Paul and completely subvert everything that he actually stood no, for? No, I want somebody to come after Ron Paul and perfect it. Yeah. We thought Reagan would perfect right. it. We now know he didn't. For a variety of reasons, right. we could talk about it in another, in another forum. But Ron has succeeded in moving into the mainstream debates over issues and institutions uh, which are very serious, like the Federal Reserve. Right. 20 and years, the 20 years ago, yeah. uh, the establishment didn't want to talk about the Federal right. Reserve. Now, even Democrats are saying, you know what, we need to know what's going on there. Right. And, and all because of Ron. And also the Pentagon. I mean, he has really, yes. I mean, not since, uh, you know, basically not since Eisenhower warned about a military industrial complex do we have a guy who's actually, you know, f putting that on the agenda. Correct. Um, let's talk about uh, some of the dicier issues uh, or ones that separate libertarians among themselves. Uh, in your book, you talk about the uh, right to own your own body, uh, but then you're also very uh, pro-life. You're anti-abortion. I am. Um, so where does the right to own your own body stop and where does the uh, right to the uh, infant or the fetus or the potential human life begin? I believe, and it is a, it is a question of science and it is a question of, uh, of faith, 
that a fertilized egg is a human being. It is the byproduct of uh, copulation by two human beings. I'm not talking about some scientist in a Petri dish now. And it has a full human genome, and I accept that as a, as a definition. Uh, stated differently, it has all the chemical and biological makeup necessary to become human with the, with the, to become a person as we understand it. Now that's a, a postnatal a, person a with nourishment. A fertilized egg that has been implanted in, in the uterine wall. Is it not, just, not just simply a fertilized egg. Correct. Because, okay. Correct. Correct. If we can't draw the line there, there is no intellectually acceptable place to draw the line other than the convenience of the mother. So when I say you have the right to own your own body, the fetus is not your body. People say it's easy for you to say that because you're not a woman. I am obviously not a woman. But I say it because of my fidelity to some basic libertarian virtues, the primacy of the individual. The individual is greater than the state. The state cannot, without the, the greatest violation of, of a moral law, authorize one human being to take the life of another. Do you support the prosecution of doctors and nurses and medical personnel who uh, perform abortions? The answer is yes. However, we have not seen that mm -hmm. because of the uh, bizarre frequency with which uh, abortion what about, occurs. Uh, what about women uh, who, pr you know, who have abortions uh, performed and, uh, you know, let's say the men who drive them there as well, should they be prosecuted? Anyone who kills an innocent life, whether it's George W. Bush or somebody in a back alley, should be prosecuted for killing the innocent life. I'm not suggesting George W. Bush in this context with right. respect to abortions. I'm talking about other, right. yeah, other yeah, killings yeah, sure. for other goals yeah. that he stated. Where, where does this rank? I mean, because this seems like it should be at the very pinnacle of your... It should, uh, but it's not. Yeah, so it's it, just not. explain a little bit I about mean, that. I if, mean, if, uh, if the government were in the streets randomly killing people, there would be riots in the streets to stop it. But because we have sterilized this murder, authorized it, legislated it, uh, blessed it, if you will, lowercase b and blessed, uh, there are no riots in the streets uh, because the uh, victims cannot uh, speak for themselves because they are totally dependent upon the perpetrator of the crime because it happens in a sterile environment. There, are, there is not an outcry, well, as there should be. Within the, the kind of broad base, I mean, you have uh, thousands of people a year on your show. You talk to a lot of libertarian audiences. Uh, you're a crowd favorite. I mean, you are the rock star of Freedom Fest in Las Vegas every year uh, and other Don't because you weren't there this year. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> but um, how many people agree with you uh, who call themselves libertarian, would you guess? And I, I, how, would, how you I would say that them? about half of our libertarian colleagues uh, are pro-life. Uh, and about half are not. Well, and then you had mentioned that it's a, uh, for you, it's a matter of science and of faith. One of the chapters in your book, which I think is uh, wonderful, is, uh, you quote from the, uh, the great uh, play, A Man for All Seasons, which is about Thomas More. Right. Uh, and uh, you call it, When the Devil Turned Round on You, which is a line about how, uh, you know, you, you need to understand the state needs to be relatively powerless because once it becomes powerful enough to do what you want, then it can turn on you. What's the role of faith? You are a, a practicing Catholic. Uh, a lot of libertarians are, seem hostile to religion or indifferent to religion. What's the role of uh, re your religious beliefs in your uh, belief in individual dignity and rights? I am not just a Catholic. I have to characterize this today because of what's been happening to the Catholic Church in the past 50 years. I am a pre-Vatican II Catholic. I am a traditionalist with a capital uh, T. I am an Orthodox with a lowercase o, uh, Roman Catholic. Uh, I know you're laughing because no, you and I have talked about well, this to we're no, blowing It's face. also because I'm, I'm mentally typing and shifting <laughs> capital to right, lowercase. Right, right, right. Well, yeah. I can't say uppercase o yes. because then they, they are not yes. Roman, then you're right. Eastern. Yes. Everything I do yes. or say uh, is filtered through my internal screen uh, of Catholicism. I am thrilled beyond compare at the number of libertarians who carry rosary beads uh, in their pockets. Uh, think of the message of Jesus. The individual is greater than the state. I am here to save individuals in spite of the state. This is a libertarian message, if ever there was one. Does it mean you have to be Catholic? Does it mean you even have to believe uh, in God? Uh, if you believe as I do, that we were created in the image and likeness of God, then as 
God is perfectly free, we are perfectly free. If we believe that we are the, the highest result of some natural selection, then you also believe that that highest result, humanity, has free will and intellect uh, to exercise that free will. E either origin, biological or theological, gets you to the point of the primacy of the individual over its artificial organization based on a monopoly of force, which we call the government. Uh, Jesus is also uh, remembered for saying, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and render unto God that which is God's. How do, we, how do you tell the difference? I mean, you talk a lot in your books consistently and in your show about natural law, higher law. Explain that for people who might not be familiar with it, and how, how does that help you decide, okay, well, Caesar has a legitimate claim on this, but not on this. The, the natural law teaches, this is uh, Aristotle, uh, this is Aquinas, this is Thomas Moore, this is John Locke, this mm -hmm. is Thomas Jefferson, this is Clarence Thomas, mm -hmm. to some extent, Nino Scalia uh, as well. I mean them no disrespect by calling them by their first names. Um, argument is that our rights come from our humanity that my right to think as I wish and speak as I think and publish as I speak, to worship or not to worship, self-defense, privacy, my right to be left alone, are integral to my existence. I have them because I'm a human being. They don't come from the government. That's not an academic argument mm -hmm. because if these rights do come from the government, then the government by ordinary legislation or executive command can restrict those rights. If they come from my humanity, then the Fifth Amendment comes in. The government can only interfere with those rights, life, liberty, or property, with due process, meaning show me what I did wrong, prove it to a neutral jury, let me defend myself and challenge you and give me the right to appeal. Basic and, due process. And, but then also, it's not simply procedural due process, right? It's substantive it's because substantive your book, Dred process. Scott's Revenge, which is a fascinating history of race and law in America, I mean, you, you know, you take issue with the Dred Scott decision. Because some things are just plain wrong. Right. And to suggest that one class of people can enslave another class of people, not because of any culpability on the part of the enslaved class, but just by virtue of their place of origin or the color of their skin, violates substantive due process, which basically means the law has to be fair. It has to be, as Aquinas would have said and did say, a rule of right reason for the common good, not a rule of convenience for the good of some. So where does taxation fit into that? So the, the, uh, the income tax as opposed to excise taxes, uh, because the federal government before we had a personal income tax, most of their money came from tariffs and excise taxes. Are those moral and income tax immoral or are both moral? Or You're home at night and someone knocks on the door and you answer the door and there's a guy with a gun and the guy says, give me your money, I want to give it away in your name. Was this guy crazy? You call the police, you find out he's an IRS agent. So that's what taxation is. It is the government extracting money from you against your will to give it away in your name. I'll say this plainly, I've said it before. Taxation is theft. It presumes that the government has a higher claim on our property than we do. When the government imposed excise taxes, that was a user fee. You want to use the government's port. The government owns the water and owns the earth. It shouldn't, but it does. Um, you have to pay for that right. So before the war between the states, the central government existed by user fees. Uh, it existed by selling government land. Government still owns, what, 88% of Nevada. That's a lot of land. Uh, and it also exi existed by um, uh, imposing burdens on the states, financial burdens, for the services the central government performed. That's the way it was intended to be. Uh, after the 16th and 17th Amendments, the Senate is no longer representative of the states and the feds can take a portion of, uh, of your income tax, the feds take whatever they want. If those two amendments alone were to be repealed, the government would go back to the confines of the Constitution almost overnight. Now, uh, you know, it's funny, you, you talked about the war between the states as opposed to the Civil War. Uh, you call common, the Civil yeah. War. I don't want to get snarky. Um, well, uh, I was going to ask now, here clearly, and you mentioned Lincoln in a negative way, Lincoln in many ways is the worst violator of the Constitution, you know, just, uh, you know, when you run through what he did in order to prosecute yes. the Civil War. The Confederate States of America, worse still, because they were fighting for the right to uh, maintain slavery, right? I believe that they were fighting for a right to secede from a central government, just as we seceded right. from Great Britain. They were also fighting for slavery. 
the worst abomination in the history of the world. So, but it is not the job of the United States of America to go around and looking for monsters right. to slay, which is what mm -hmm. Lincoln did. Yeah. So w if, if, put yourself back in 1860, would you have joined an Abraham Lincoln Brigade, obviously named something different, at the time maybe a John Brown Brigade to go in and help overthrow the Confederate States of America? I think that slavery would have died a natural death here as it did in Puerto Rico, in Brazil, in Portugal, and in uh, Great Britain. And I think it was on the verge of doing that at the time Lincoln decided to start killing people. In your book, uh, you quote, uh, you know, the, uh, I guess, Thomas Paine, and then you said it's also, it goes back to Aquinas, but that we have a positive moral duty to disobey stupidity. Right. In the same chapter, you also uh, uh, talk about, and I'm quoting here, wise, folk, wise folks are buying guns and gold. Are you getting militant? Are we going to see, are you going to be having Patty Hearst on your show anytime soon? <laughs> She's still wearing around. Wearing a beret? <laughs> um, but what, you know, what are, what are you getting at there? And at what point does the uh, positive moral duty to disobey stupidity and, and to refuse to go along with laws that are immoral, right. well, Aqu Aquinas, does that sanction violence against the state? There's a potential for violence. Yeah. I'm certainly not encouraging violence, uh, but Aquinas uh, taught us that you, an unjust law is no law at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the sit-ins at the lunch counters in the South in the 50s and 60s, these are courageous people <clears throat> who were using nonviolent means to resist and reject an unjust law, Jim Crow law. The Jim Crow laws compelled the lunch counter owner to segregate by sex, whether the lunch counter owner wanted to do it or not. The evil was the law. The evil was not the person behind uh, the lunch counter. The Southern legislatures lacked the political will to change that. The Southern courts lacked the political and the intellectual will to change it. It was only a nonviolent refusal to obey an unjust law that changed it. That's what I'm talking about. Right. Bring it to today. We'll go back to our friends in the library in Bridgeport. The, the end of that story is a happy one, by the way, because on, on the eve of the trial of the by then 87-year-old librarian and her 77-year-old assistant, a federal judge said to the U.S. attorneys, I'm about to declare the Patriot Act unconstitutional. Do you still want to go after these two ladies for discussing this warrant? Suddenly the case disappeared. Lately, another sub rosa trend I'll tell you about. Federal agents serving self-written search warrants on, say, a person who owns a computer store wanting to know who bought a mobile phone or who bought a laptop. They're not complying with it. They're taking it to a lawyer and challenging it. And what are judges doing? Invalidating it. Is that a technical violation of the Patriot Act? Yes, it is. Does it result in a greater freedom? Yes, it does. Is it an example of violating an unjust law without obstructing a governmental function and without causing violence? Yes, it is. So that's what I'm talking about on the end at the end. In terms of guns uh, and gold, they are the only material things that will save us. Uh, talk about Occupy Wall Street real briefly, because they, they believe that they are uh, protesting, you know, in the name of a higher law of, of righteousness. Um, where, where are they, where do you find them mistaken? We, we sent some of our Freedom Watch producers down there to interact with them, and we were surprised at what we found. And, and this is a month ago now. I know this is a, a changing by the right. minute. I believe it has since been taken over by the Democratic Party and professional activists. But before that happened, at least in the crowds that we interviewed in lower Manhattan in late September, about a third of the people were wearing pins or carrying flags that said, don't tread on me. And of the demands of the crowd and the Fed and the wars and the IRS, the Wall Street crowd was going along with the first two. Now, they don't, the, the lefties don't want to end the IRS. They want to use the IRS to steal more than it already steals. And the other day I was speaking at a group and some of these folks showed up. I couldn't hear what they were saying because they were screaming so loud. I said, I may disagree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. The crowd loved it and they loved it. I welcome this controversy. I welcome uh, this dispute. Obviously, I condemn the notion that the government should use its power to take from those who have and give to those who have not. But to the extent that this causes a debate about the fundamental role of government in our lives, it's a good one. The issue in New York is a bizarre one because it's private property dedicated to the public use by the force of law. It's a bad law. You should be able to invite and exclude whomever you want on your own private property. The city of New York does not permit that because the city of New York barely, barely recognizes private property rights. Yeah, right.
Well, I want to uh, thank Judge Andrew Napolitano, the host of Freedom Watch on Fox Business, Monday through Friday. It's a great show. And also the author now, most recently, of It is Dangerous to be Right When Your Government is Wrong. Judge, thanks very much for talking Pleasure. to Reason thank TV. Thank you for coming on my show once a week. We love it. I appreciate that very much. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.